Hello, I'm Rex McGregor, a playwright based in Auckland, New Zealand. I first began becoming interested in theatre um, when I was in the equivalent of your high school. And um, I didn't really get a chance to do much acting or writing, but I was interested in theatre generally. So when I first went to university, that's when my um, passion really took off because I started writing plays and I was also studying French and German literature and quite a lot of that was focused on drama. So I wrote my first script when I was in my first year at university. And um, in my second year at university, I got an opportunity to um, do some acting. So I did a script um, that was in French, which was my uh, introduction to uh, acting. Um, and we did a short comedy there, and um, that was so successful, they asked me back the next year to play um, a murderer, one of the conspirators in Camus' um, play Caligula about the Roman Empire. So I got to um, lead the conspirators and stab the um, rogue emperor in the back, and it was um, very dramatic and um, a good um, experience of um, live theatre because we went on a mini tour around um, a few places in um, the Auckland region. So I'm in Auckland, New Zealand at the moment, and that's where I've lived um, most of my life. And um, after um, university, I became interested in writing plays more. So I did a few, but it was very hard to get any traction, to get any productions. So... I eventually um, put it on the back burner and um, did things like um, went um, secondary school teaching for a while. And um, after that, I um, became a librarian. And um, I was interested in theatre as a um, member of the audience at the stage. But it wasn't until I saw a production of um, Short and Sweet, which was a production of a group of 10-minute plays. And I thought, gee, that sounds like fun. And a lot of them were really um, well-written and sharp and focused. And I thought, I should do some of that. And luckily in the audience there was um, a woman that I knew who was also a writer. And she said, oh, we've got a theatre group that are looking for some 10 minute plays. So I thought, oh, well, I'll write a couple and send them off. And they liked both of them. So they did a reading of both of those. And um, that was about 10 years ago. And ever since then, I've been focusing on mainly writing 10 minute comedies. And I've been lucky enough to get productions in the US and the UK and Europe and some places in Asia and Australia as well. Writing, I've always been interested in mainly because I like the idea of getting into other people's heads and um, character is for me the real basis of dramatic writing. So I think of um, plots as characters in action. So I've, I like the idea of creating different worlds and um, uh, becoming like almost a schizophrenic character where I don't have a personality of my own. I have multiple personalities. So one way I put it once was that um, multiple personality disorder is a job requirement if you're a playwright because you have to actually get into other people's heads. I like plays as opposed to, um, for example, short stories or novels or um, even screenwriting because of the immediacy of the interaction with the audience you get um, a real vibe from a live audience that I don't think you get even with um, film where it's all prepackaged for the consumer to um, consume at a later date. And the other reason I don't really like um, short stories or novels or that format of literature is that I've, I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> and one of the reasons I focus on 10 minute plays is I want to you know, get to it, get to the action. And um, when I read a novel, I'm always saying, you know, I don't need all this description, all this, um, all these literary words, all these adjectives and adverbs. I want to hear what the characters are saying. And, um, you yeah, know, I've written a few short stories, but 
they're really um, disguised plays. Like um, sometimes they're like a, an extended monologue that's in the format of a, a short story, but it really could work on stage. For my um, literary process or the cre creative process, I don't really have any set formula. Sometimes the spark will be um, a character or a group of characters. Sometimes it will be an idea of a, a plot point or even the twist at the end of a play and I'll work backwards to there. So I don't have any standard practice. And just lately I've um, been inspired by prompts that um, theatres send out. So quite a lot of the work I've been doing just in the last few months is directly in response to requests from theatres. For example, just recently I've written one that had to be set in Santa's workshop or one that had to be set on a high school football field. And um, I don't have any interest in football, so I wrote one about cheerleaders. So um, prompts um, sometimes get you to write things that you would never otherwise do. Another one was... Um, it had to focus on a wild turkey. So I wrote a, a comedy with two, two turkeys interacting, which I would never have thought of doing otherwise. And um, yeah, that's, that's um, a really good way just to um, get the spark going because it can be anything that can trigger your writing. So that festival in Paris is... Um, for short Christmas plays, and I had already written several, so I submitted them. And the way I got um, into that is I belong to a to an online group called Playwrights Binge, which is a group of playwrights who share opportunities from mainly in the US, but sometimes in the UK and further afield. And um, one of the members there mentioned that he had a script on in Paris so I thought, oh, that sounds like an interesting thing because I'm trying to get as many cities in the world to produce my work as possible. So I wrote to the woman, Stephanie Campion, who's in charge of the Moving Parts Theatre Company there, and um, said, I've got a few scripts that are actually set in Paris, so would you be interested in doing a reading? So I sent one off, which was um, about uh, the French scientist Antoine Lavoisier and his wife, Marianne during the French Revolution, where she's trying to protect him from going to the guillotine. So it's a, just another 10 minute play and um, Stephanie liked it and she said, well, I'll be, I'm interested in directing that. So she directed it in um, Paris and I was able to get up very early in the morning because they're 12 hours ahead of us here. So evening in Paris is very early in the morning here. So I attended that. And then I mentioned that that play was actually part of a trilogy of plays called Female Scientists to the Rescue. And I said, you know, would you be interested in, in seeing the others? So I then sent across one about Marie Curie and they've produced that. And the next one um, is coming early in 2021, which is called Zany Planets. So eventually they will do the, the trilogy of plays. The first two are actually set in Paris and they actually managed to get um, French actors um, in English, performing in English, but it was nice to get um, some authentic um, French actors working on those scripts. And so things bloom. So once uh, that director gets to know you, then she was interested in my two Christmas plays, which I'd, been written, which I'd written earlier for other opportunities. So Grounding Santa was a really fun play to write. And um, ironically, I, just this very day, about a couple of hours ago, I saw the first read-through of that. It was done in Philadelphia. And um, the play was written in response to um, some very specific prompts by another theatre in Florida, and they're producing it um, tomorrow. So this play has got um, several productions lined up. It's also going to be in the, in the Paris Festival and um, another one as well. So... The idea was that it had to be sent in, set in Santa's workshop. It had to um, feature a toy that was in the process of being made, and it had to have one specific line of dialogue. So I managed to incorporate those all, all those um, aspects into one script. So my first um, thing was Santa's workshop, what can I do there? And I thought, um, well, they've, 
the movie Elf has already been done, so I don't want to focus on elves. And there's been a lot of things like Mrs. Santa Claus, so I don't want to do that. So I wanted to do something a bit original. So I thought, hmm, who is actually who is Santa Claus? And I thought, well, he's a bit like one of the wizards in Harry Potter. So I looked online, and there is actually this um, whole fan base thing where, gee, maybe Santa Claus is actually a wizard who was expelled from Hogwarts in the Harry Potter world. So I thought, I thought I'll, I'll run with that. So in my script, what happens is um, Santa's on Christmas Eve, and he's all ready to um, go off with his reindeer and deliver his presents. But a visitor comes from the Potterverse, and this is a young woman called Scroogeette, based on Scrooge. And um, she's trying to stop him because he's openly performing magic. And that, that's against the um, the um, rules of the Harry Potter world where wizards are supposed to keep um, quiet. And in this story, he's been banished to um, the North Pole for being too helpful and generous to muggles. And um, Scrooge yet is a bit concerned that if he continues with his behaviour, he's going to um, expose the whole world and she tries to shut him down and basically ground him. So that's the plot line and there's a nice little twist at the end. So that's the um, the urgency for that was that I had to write it within a 48 hours. So it's, and it also had to be um, under five pages. So that really focuses you actually. I. My speciality is 10 minute plays, which are usually 10 pages. And this one had to be five pages. So that really focuses it. You have to get straight into it. And there has to be rather a clear arc where the character starts at one point and then moves to somewhere else, all within five minutes. So it was a bit of a challenge, but it was a lot, a lot of fun to write. And that weekend, I had to actually write another one too. I had no, actually, I had to write two other scripts. So, um, the festival is called Three by Three. So what they do is they give um, writers three sets of prompts and ask them to um, write three very short works over 48 hours. And um, generally people go for monologues. So this play has um, two characters, but the other two plays um, I wrote were just monologues. It's really just um, a fun piece where People will um, hopefully just enjoy the, the, the characters because there's a bit of a contrast between them where one is um, saying, you know, I'm really trying to help people and the other one is basically trying to shut them down. So there's a lot of conflict there. And I think the characters are quite relatable because people can um, understand when somebody tries to stop you from doing something, you, you're apt to get a bit annoyed and frustrated and that's what Santa does. But he also has a, a way to get around this character and um, get her on board. So that's what I'm hoping the characters, the um, audience will enjoy the, the to and fro between the characters and the resolution too. Okay, so Next Door Nativity is a 10 minute comedy, which I wrote several years ago. And that was um, just in response to general calls for um, plays about Christmas. So I was thinking, you know, what can I do to, to do something that's a bit different because one of my big things is I always like to be original in my um, ideas. So I don't like to do something that someone else has done before. So I thought, hmm, Christmas, nativity plays. Oh, there's an awful lot of, um, you know, even every, every school pageant does a nativity play. How can I do a different take on that? So I thought, okay, so what about who else was there on the day of the nativity when you've got, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in the, the stable and everybody knows that scene. So I thought, who can I, who else was around? So I thought, oh, well, that, that was the um, year of the census. And the reason that Mary and Joseph had gone to Bethlehem was to go to their hometown for the census. So other people from Galilee must have come there as well. So who else was in Galilee? And I was thinking, well, in the Bible, there's all those fishermen that were fishing on the Sea of Galilee when, when Jesus was preaching later on in his life. What, what can I do with those? So I thought, hmm, a couple of his disciples were um, fishermen. So what if they were born around the same time Jesus was born? So you've got two little babies. And I thought, James and John, I'll make them twins. 
and I'll do their parents. So their parents are actually mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament, um, Salome and Zebedee. And they're just lovely names. So I thought, well, we'll call them Sal and Zeb. And I made the, the play focus on those two. So it's a family comedy in a way where Sal and Zeb are fishermen. Well, he's a fisherman and his wife who go to Bethlehem and they are trying to um, cope with screaming babies. And they're looking out the window and Mary's baby never cries. It's a perfect little baby. And she's got all these wise men and shepherds looking after Mary. So Sal's a bit jealous and she wants Zeb to make something of his life. So the conflict is um, between those two, but also another character comes from outside. So Sal calls down and wants one of the, the, dr the drummer boy. So I thought I'd get the little drummer boy into the story. So he comes up, uses his drums to soothe the, um, the babies. And it turns out that um, he's on a mission to kill the newborn baby from Galilee who's going to stop Herod, um, Herod becoming king. So originally his target is going to be the baby Jesus. So he just wants to get up in the room so he can use his crossbow, shoot little baby Jesus. But when he hears that um, Sal and Zeba from um, Galilee, he realizes, oh, I have to kill the firstborn from that family too. But he can't figure out which of the two twins is the firstborn, so he gives up on his mission. And it turns out that um, he's hopeless at his job as an assassin, so Zeb offers him a job as a fisherman. And um, his name is Simon, so he agrees to um, work for Zeb and he will be the Simon who becomes Saint Peter because Simon's name was Peter and his brother Andrew will also join him. So it's all linked up. So it's a nice way of getting the Bible story from a totally different slant. And um, yeah, I'll enjoy, um, I've never actually heard that play yet. I'm particularly interested in the, the festival in Paris and in, in hearing um, both Grounding Centre and Next Door Nativity. And I'm particularly interested in Next Door Nativity because as I said, I've I've only, I've actually heard it once in a reading now, I just remembered, I have actually heard it in a reading um, in Northampton where it was done in a um, very almost like slapsticky way. So it'll be interesting to see what take they do on it whether they um, go for the more human style of it. And there is some slapstick comic elements in it, but it's always interesting um, how a different director will approach it. And Stephanie's quite a, a um, invent, an inventive director, so I'm sure she's going to have an int interesting approach to it. And um, there's um, some interesting effects in the Grounding Centre one too, where... Um, I've always envisioned it, if you were doing it on, on like on Zoom, you could do um, a green screen because what happens is um, an amputee has her arm suddenly grow and the way you could do with that with a green screen would be slip a green sock, sock over your arm with a green screen behind it. And if you pull the, the sock off, it will look as though your arm magically appears. So um, I'll see how they do that. So I'm interested in the, the staging of both those plays. Uh, the Rough Magic Theatre Company has, is a company I've worked for a couple of times. They're the company that um, sends out um, requests with prompts. And uh, I saw their opportunity listed on one of these playwriting groups. And I thought, oh, gee, that looks like fun. And I don't have anything I'm particularly writing um, this weekend. So <laughs> it would be nice to get some prompts to um stir my juices and um, so I sent some scripts off to them and they performed several of them and they invited me back later to um, work on another show and um, I've um, done two of their shows now and, and they're a fun company because they've got some very um, vibrant actors at the moment they're all social distancing and um, they bring some really interesting um, ways of staging to their shows. And uh, it's always a joy. You never know quite what they're doing. Um, I'll tell you um, the one I, uh, there's two on tomorrow. I'm watching Grounding Santa, which I've told you a bit about. The other one was a monologue 
And I'll tell you what the prompt was, and then I'll tell you what I'm hoping will happen. So the prompt was that it had to um, be set in a department store at a gift wrapping station. So that's something quite specific. And I thought, my goodness, I never thought about writing with a gift wrapping station. I hardly ever use them or know anything about them. So what can I do here that's something really original? So the way I thought of it was, um, what is the most original or unusual gift I can think about that, that somebody would actually wrap? And I was thinking, what sort of most gifts are really pretty boring or, or straightforward. And then I thought, hmm, what if I think a bit more broadly? And I'll, I'll give you the twist here. So you know what I'm talking about, but in the show, um, the twist doesn't come to the end. So my character is a gangster, but a very friendly gangster from 1945. And he brings this unusually shaped parcel up to the um, counter and asks this, shows this woman what it is, but the audience doesn't know what the parcel is. So this woman who's doing the wrapping, who you don't see because it's a monologue, but you can tell she's reacting with a horror um, she doesn't know what to expect with this horrible object that's landed in front of her. And the very friendly gangster who's based on um, one of the D Damon Runyon char characters from, um, I don't know if you know God Guys and Dolls, but it's a musical um, about shady characters. And they have a very specific way of speaking um, where they don't do... Um, contractions like they'll say do not instead instead of don't etc so it's a very stilted way of speaking but this character is very friendly it's based on the nicely nicely character from guys and dolls basically and he tries to persuade this gift wrapper why she should wrap this object and he event eventually convinces her but the twist at the end is that the object she's wrapping is actually a horse's head which is is taken from the Godfather where a horse's head was sliced off and put into the bed of a, a um, rival um, who um, the Godfather was trying to make an offer that he couldn't refuse. So there's a nice little twist there. So I'm interested to see what they will do with that. I, I want them to enjoy the character all the way through and also to um, keep wondering all the way through, what are they talking about? There's obviously something that's made this woman gasp, but the guy seems to be quite happy and cheerful about it. So why is she freaking out? What, what could be so horrible that you it's set in Macy's department store in New York? What could be so horrible that she's freaking out? And I hope they get a, a little bit of a buzz out of the twist at the end because it's not revealed until the very last line. The Third Citizen Theatre Company um, put out a call for a show called Digital Dionysia. And they asked for scripts under 15 minutes based on ancient Greek myths. Now, I've written probably over 100 10-minute plays. So often for um, short play opportunities, the first thing I look in my catalogue, I'm reasonably lazy. If I've already got something, I'll just pluck it out and, and send it, as I did with these Christmas plays, which weren't necessarily written for Paris, for example. But um, I thought, gee, I don't actually have any 10-minute um, plays based on Greek myths. I better write one. So I thought, hmm, I know a bit about um, Greek mythology and, and Greek history, but uh, I couldn't think of, I had to do something that's a bit original. So it was only based on um, Greek mythology. So I thought, right, I'll set it in modern day, but I'll take a a story from the ancient Greek theater. So I took a play that's, I took a um, story that's based on the three great um, playwrights from ancient Greece. And it's the Orestes Electra Agamemnon story where um, Clytemnestra kills her husband and then their son Orestes kills her to get revenge. So this gave me the idea, hmm, what about a family where um, they kill each other, but make it into a comedy and set in modern day. So I thought, oh, I'll do that. 
So the ancient Greek myth was set in Argos in Greece. So I thought, I thought, what if I Google Argos and is there anywhere in the world that's um, got a name similar? And sure enough, there is a place called Argos in California, your state. And wonderfully, it's set very close to Death Valley. So, I, oh, this is just jewels, you know, a blessing that, that um, there's a place that is to do with death and you're thinking about writing a play with murder. I've got to use this. So it's set in the desert. So I thought, oh, well, I'll incorporate that into it. So the play is called Murder Runs in Our Family. And um, just yesterday I attended a rehearsal for it and they're doing very well with it and I'm really looking forward, it, forward to it. So it's basically a modern day take on a woman who has killed her husband, but she had a good um, reason for it. And the son is actually trying to protect his reputation because he's a political candidate. And um, he goes to all lengths to stop his mother's story from coming out, but he gets into um, conflict with his sister, who's also based on one of the characters. So it's a very um, light and um, entertaining play about murder. That play reading will take place with a whole lot of other plays that have also been written about um, ancient Greece. So I hope mine is, stands out as being something unique and um, comic, because I'm not sure that many of the others will be um, quite as um, farcical as mine. And I hope um, the audiences can relate to the characters, particularly the elderly woman character, because a, a good comment was made from the actor who's playing that character, she said, oh, it's wonderful to play an old lady who has still got her marbles. So in my script, the Clytemnestra character has become Clytie, and she is a, um, a blogger, and her blog is called Clytie's Climaxes. And I just love that because it's not explained in the script, but I imagine it as being something very raunchy, uh, will embarrass her son. And I hope the audience um, loves that character as much as I do. So the Eva's Echo Theatre Company is a company in Galway in Ireland, and they put out a call out for monologues under five minutes that um, could slot into a show for the Samaritans, a charity show. And I looked into my back catalogue and luckily, yes, I do have something so I don't have to create something Specifically for this, I've got something that I can reuse. And I actually did a recording of this piece. And um, I'll just tell you how that came about. Um, before the um, COVID lockdown, I had a um, play scheduled to be performed by the Town Street Theatre Company in Los Angeles. And they were going to produce, well, they still are, once lockdown is over, once the COVID vaccine is an operation. This play is called The Threatened Panda Fights Back, and that's my most popular play. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the Town Street Theatre will put a take on that. But because that was delayed for you know many months, they thought, well, we'll do an online show instead. So they did a call out for plays you know, related to the to um, the COVID situation. So I had a few months ago written a play called The Birds Are Feeding Me. And for this year, that has been my most popular script. It's been produced several times in the UK and um, about 10 times in the US. So it's really struck a nerve and um, it's a fun piece. So in the... Um, Los Angeles Town Street um, production of that, there was a particular actor who was very good um, called Kira Hogue. And I thought, oh, I'll make a note of her. And if I ever need to um, find a character for her, I'll be sure to contact her. So in the meantime, um, one of the Rough Magic Theatre Company's um, requests was for a um, script about a cat and I thought, hmm, I'll do one about a cat in lockdown, imagining that all the things around her, like um, the people being home, 
the extra toilet paper, the stocking up with food, it's all for her. Everything's being done for the cat. So it's a cat's eye view of um, the COVID-19 situation. And it's called Tabby's Plague Diary. So I did a recording of that with um, Kira in Los Angeles. And um, this was the perfect opportunity to send it off to Galway. So we sent it off and um, it was slotted into their show. So Tabby's Plague Diary is a very fun piece and um, it's meant to um, elicit sympathy for the cat. So the cat is very much a self-centered animal at the start in particular, thinks all these things are happening around her. But as things go on, she begins to think, oh, maybe they're actually trying to help me because I've been trying to get pregnant, but I can't. So the cat has obviously been spayed, but from the cat's point of view, she's being taken to the vet all the time. So she thinks that they're trying to cure her infertility. So at the end of the play, the cat decides, oh, well, I'll try and comfort my owner and her daughter by um, letting them stroke my fur and rubbing up against their legs. So there's a little bit of a twist where the cat who was so self-centered suddenly becomes, decides to help her owner and uh, I think the audience will enjoy that. If you want to um, see any um, video clips of my plays, uh, there's a couple of places you can go. Uh, the first place would be my website, rexmcgregor.com. So I have a banner at the top of my website with a whole lot of um, screenshots going across. And if you click on, on any one of those um, screenshots at the top banner, that will take you through to a video of, of that show, um, usually on YouTube, sometimes on Facebook or Vimeo. And I also have a YouTube channel, which has got both the um, shows that I've recorded myself or have had access to placing on my website, or there's a playlist of called Rex McGregor Plays, which um, includes um, shows that I've had nothing to do with the production, but you can go through and watch the links there. So if you'd, if you'd been talking to me a year ago, um, this section of my, um, my um, work would have been far smaller because in, in pre-COVID days, um, theatre companies very rarely would do a video recording of their shows. But um, since Zoom, um, a lot of things are being recorded and um, I've had far more over the last 12 months than probably in the last 10 years of shows being recorded because theatre is often just relatively um, fleeting. The show, you have to be there to catch it, but now you can watch them on, on video.